Hi there, welcome to part two of my Creating a Likeness two-part series. I'll have a pop-up card so you can link through to the first video that shows you how I created this sketch. Whether working traditionally or digitally, I sketch exactly the same. This video, however, is going to concentrate how I go about adding colour. And this I do the same way, whether working traditionally or digitally too. I hope you enjoy this video and here we go. So I begin by adding the dark areas first. I've already added the dark area, dark brown colour to the inside of the mouth because that's all in shadow. And now I'm just adding some base colours to the eye. Just a few darks, I'll add a highlight and I'll work back on the eye in a bit. So it doesn't matter whether I'm working in traditional mediums or digitally, I always work the same. So the sketching process is nine times out of ten, it's always the same as is adding colour. Tend to go in with the darks first and this is applied if I'm working in oil paints, acrylics, digital you can go dark to light or light to dark, gouache even though it's a water based um, medium I still work dark to light. If I'm working in watercolours however I work from light to dark because they're translucent um, as opposed to opaque mediums. Okay so back to this I've zoomed out a little bit so you can see where I've added some base colours to the eye and also the darks as I spoke about in the mouth. Now adding some darks to the area running down from underneath the eye to the bottom of the jaw. I keep referring back to my reference image the whole time. Now what I'm going to do for the viewers at home is in the description below as along with all the materials that I've used to create this video I'm also going to put a link there so you can actually use a camel image if you want to create a camel drawing sketch or painting yourself and the link is going to take you to a website called Pixabay and the photographs most of the photographs on there have been added and are copyright free so that I will put a link to one of a camel that's on there, although there's plenty of other camels on there if you want to go and take a look. And you can use them to sketch from, paint from, until um, your sketchbook is full of camel designs. There's loads on there. Um, unfortunately, I won't be sharing the image that I took to work from for this particular painting because I'm going to use it for some uh, branding ideas that I have for myself. I also have some full body images of this particular camel and I would eventually like to make a full painting of him. Okay, back to the painting. So during this painting you'll see me flip from place to place. At the minute I'm adding all the darks and I do this no matter what medium I'm working in. So whatever you see me do here is typical of how I work. Adding in the darks is always a great place to begin with because you've already got the a base tone, a mid-tone running throughout which is your toned paper or toned canvas. I've already put down the mid-tone brown and I know that everything else is either going to be darker than this or lighter than this. And the reason I do this is to get the contrast to begin with. By applying the darks first, the darkest areas of the painting helps me to have an overall idea of the contrast of the painting but you'll see this as we work along. So when you're adding your darks, how I do it, I never go to complete black. If you look at the colour wheel on the right hand side, it's, show, it's showing a very very dark brown that I'm working with but it's not actually black. When you're applying your, your darks, never apply your darkest of darks, never apply black and when you start adding your lights, never add white because the trouble is if you've already had white and then you need to put detailed on top that may have white in it, it won't show up. And the same with your darks. If I went straight in with black, and well, not that I ever used black on its own, but if I did go straight in with black and then wanted to ha add black details to it, I wouldn't be able to because I've always, already gone that dark. Okay, so adding these base coats. Now you could think to yourself, well, 
hardly any of this is going to be seen so I'll just slap some colour on some people do like to work with that and they do literally build up a blockish um, base coat of colours but I prefer to work it in little bits at a time and also in the correct direction of the hair or feathers or scales whatever I'm working on at the time the simple reason is for me is if any of it were to show through towards the end of the painting at least I know that it's all going to be um, heading in the right direction uh, for me that takes a little bit of the strain out of the uh, getting everything to a finer point right at the very be very end sorry you'll have to forgive me this is the third time doing this uh, voice recording for this one video because it kept going glitchy on me so hopefully everything's running smooth and the playback will be smooth as well so if I keep tripping myself up with my words that and you've seen my other videos then you should be used to it by now <laughs> hopefully I will get better as um, time goes on can live in hope okay so we're just applying some more darks now on this bearded area it's like a beard running down his throat area as well and just keep in mind if you're doing hair whether it's short or long just keep your eye on your reference image at all times because over the course of the contour of a face or the contour of a body textures will change and along with the textures will be hair length direction hair width and just keep all of that in mind uh, when you're referring to your reference image try and just take all of that in um, just adding some lighter tones here again we're not going for the brightest highlights just yet these are still building up for base coats so all the detailing will go on top of this so these are still base coats at the moment as I said we're working across a canvas that is now covered with a mid-tone you can if you want to sketch, um, sketching on mid-tone paper is really a good idea. If you've got any to hand, you could give it a try. You can normally get um, mid-tone papers in grey or brown. And then you all you need to do is apply your darks and your lights. And the mid-tone's already there for you. And it's, it is fun to work with. I'll do some sketching on toned paper for future reference uh, for a video. Uh, while I'm on the subject of videos, I'd like to thank everybody that's watching this and a huge thank you going out to all of my subscribers. You're just absolutely amazing. I think I'm up to 1,240-ish at the moment and it's, it's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for bearing with me and for the encouraging comments. Um, people asking me to do more content, which is great. And I do want to provide more content for you people for, because you're all just so amazing. It's uh, the support I'm having and uh, now I'm getting back into the YouTube channel is brilliant. Thank you. But what I am after, um, if you'd like to drop me some suggestions in the comments below. I've already had quite a few in my previous uh, video comments. Uh, I've got a jar and I'm going to fill it about half full I guess with pieces of paper with suggestions on so I want suggestions for mediums uh, whether it be acrylic, oil, ink, graphite, water soluble, watercolour pencils, uh, water soluble graphite, digital you, you just pop me some suggestions in and for subjects too whether it be mammals a certain type of mammal that you might like or birds, reptiles, insects as long as it's wildlife based, I want to stay clear of really horses, cats and dogs because I, I, I prefer to work um, with wildlife. Uh, so if you'd like to drop me some comments um, or if you'd like a review of a certain art material, uh, just drop me those in the comments below. I'll write them on pieces of paper, pop them in a jar and then in the not too distant future I'll start pulling them randomly out of the jar and making some fun videos to put on the YouTube channel okay back to the painting so we're building up lots of base coats as I've said even in the lightest areas that you can see across the muzzle the lip and the lips and the top of the nose still not gone in with white using the um, color palette tool on the right hand side 
as though it were my mixing palette, which it is, it's just digital. Where I'd have that um, digitally, I'd just have my normal paint palette or my coloured pencils to one side. And it's exactly the same. If you can paint traditionally, you can paint digitally. I've not been taught, I've sort of picked this up as I've gone along digital painting. I've not done an awful lot of it because really it's just for personal use. It's nice to be able to um, do a quick sketch or a quick composition with digital. I don't feel like I'm wasting any materials, which is nice um, while I'm sketching and doodling. And also you're not having to wait for drying times or anything like that. It's a process that you could just pick up and put down, um, go make a cup of tea, come back and nothing is dried that it shouldn't have dried or anything like that. So it is an ideal um, medium to mess around with. Having said that, nothing ever goes 100%. And if you'd like me to do some live streaming, whether that's with digital or traditional mediums, you'll get to see me make mistakes because everybody does. I don't know one artist, professional artist, that doesn't use an eraser of some description, whether that's painting over their mistakes or literally erasing graphite marks from a piece of paper or even digitally, you know, deleting a layer that you don't like. Um, if you sketch, if four sketches out of ten work out well for you, then give yourself a pat on the back. In actual fact, give yourself a pat on the back if you've taken time just to sit and sketch anyway. Don't ever think of it that you're wasting your time or wasting your materials in that sense because you're not, because every time you sketch, whether you realise it or not, it's a learning curve. And yes, some sketches will prove to be fruitful and you might even go on to produce um, a full painting from them even. And some won't, some sketches will be put to one side and discarded. What I do suggest is you never throw anything away because it's a good learning aid to be able to look back and self-critique um, past pieces, past sketches. And also it is a learning curve. So if you've sketched and it's not come out the way you wanted it to or the way you expected it to, still think of it as a lesson learned. There's never any such thing as a wasted sketch. Okay, moving on. We've been adding some more base coats to this little guy. And now I'm adding just sort of rough detail. So this isn't the final detail, but it's more of a texture that I'm adding to different areas on his face now. Going in a bit, little bit more so we can see a little bit better. So as you can see, these areas are quite rough, but they are giving the texture of the coat on his cheek bone and his jaw area. Um, different direction to the part of the face uh, immediately underneath the eye. And this is something just to keep your eye on. When you're working from a reference, whether it be a reference photograph, a video or in real life just keep a keen eye for direction because you could have the best fur or hair in the world but if it's not um, in a technique where I've laying it down but if it's not facing in the right direction it just won't look right also if you find that you've done say a square inch of fur and it looks absolutely perfect don't think that that same square inch of fur done that way is going to look perfect on the rest of the animal because nine times out of ten it won't and if you try and reproduce line for line um, the same procedure everywhere else it can sometimes look a bit artificial a bit like um, artificial turf <laughs> so all of the little lumps and bumps and imperfections on the skin and in the fur maybe there's some of the fur maybe wet and so it's going to clump together and that would be a different area to concentrate on as opposed to maybe above the eye or just coming out of the eye socket area. Every little bit of the animal is going to look different to the square inch that's next to it and just keep that in mind. And um, There's never any straight lines in nature so make sure you try and put a curve in your lines too. And this comes with practice. Just build it up dark to light as we go keeping an eye on our reference image at all time. If you want something to look realistic, 
then use a reference image. I don't know of any professional artists, whether they be wildlife artists or human portrait artists or landscape artists that don't use some sort of reference to work from. Now we're doing glazing. So if I was working in oils or acrylics or watercolours or even pastels, I use traditional glazing methods and here is no different. Instead of decreasing the opacity of this brush, I've just used a lighter hand, which would be like using a more transparent colour in paint. So if you were to draw white and cream lines or paint white and cream lines, let them dry, then you take a transparent or semi-transparent colour let's for instance think of the colour apricot and a very um, watered down or thin down paint medium where it's still got the colour but the pigment ratio is less and then you just sweep that across the detailing you've already done and it just tints the white or cream lines that you've already laid down and that's all that glazing is so it can be done with any colours I could glaze the whole camel purple if I wanted to as long as the purple was transparent enough to let the details show it just tint everything purple so any colour can be used as a, a glaze preferably not a colour with white in it though because white makes a colour more opaque if you want to use um, a, a colour for glazing then it's best to water it down or thin it down with a thinning medium than to add white because white will make it more opaque okay back to the camel so we can see that we used some gray undertones and base coats around the front of the lips heading from the nose downwards and now we're just applying a darker shade around the nose just so that we can get some white detailing going on top of that the whole of this project from starting the sketch to completion took round about six and a half hours when I collated all the um, film together. It was round about six and a half hours and you definitely don't want to sit and watch me digitally sketch for six and a half hours because you'd be bored stiff. Um, it was bad enough going through and editing all the video and all my pauses and reaching for a coffee and <laughs> there was nothing happening on the screen but if you want me to do a live stream just let me know uh, I don't mind doing a live stream I've not done one yet so it'd be uh, quite uh, an interesting thing to do so you could watch me make all my mistakes and yeah welcome to the world of art but that's so part and parcel of it uh, part and parcel for learning uh, I don't always know which color to reach for I might reach for a color trial it decide it's not the one for me and if you do when you're working traditionally apply a color to a painting and you don't like the color don't panic just apply it in a few different other places and that way it looks as though it's meant to be there if you just um, apply a blob of color to one area and realize you don't like it don't know how to remove it don't just leave it at that because if it's in just one area of a painting it will stand out like a sore thumb so try and get that color into other areas of your painting and then just move on if you're working in oils or acrylics um, you can go over that color so there's no no uh, harm done at all uh, working in colored pencil you it's probably there to stay so you could colour over it or glaze over it even. Um, watercolours tend to be a little less forgiving so you might have to work um, your yeah, accidental colour into a painting a little bit more. But the thing is this is where happy accidents can occur and I can remember doing a painting of a lion and I added a little bit of an apricot colour um, to it that I didn't mean to add and in the end because it stood out so much I decided to give the whole painting an apricot glaze it pulled the whole painting together and it actually made it pop it looked really really nice even if I say so myself so yeah happy accident and that was the start of my glazing career <laughs> okay moving on 
Again, using the colour mixing tool on the right hand side of the page of the screen, sorry, uh, just like a paint palette, just like you're mixing paints at, at home next to the easel, it, it works exactly the same. Uh, people who think digital art is, uh, I don't know, somehow easier than traditional art, uh, no, it's not. It might be less messy, it might be less fussy, as in you don't have to clean brushes and things, but the techniques are exactly the same. You need to know how to layer. You need to know how to freehand to a certain extent. This is all freehanding. I mean, it's not as though you can, you might be able to sit and trace your initial sketch, but after that, you're um, you're literally on your own. You, you do need how to, uh, do need to know how to control your hand and create marks on the canvas or paper or scratch board or whatever your um, art style is and technique is you need to be able to freehand and it all comes with practice practice will never make perfect but practice will make better it would be boring if we all reached perfection wouldn't it because there'd be nothing else to learn Ooh, that'd be a boring art world wouldn't it if we did all if we're all perfect and also to be critical with your work is is a positive i know some people don't like to hear criticism from other people and that's fine if you've not asked for criticism if you've not asked for people to critique your work then they shouldn't do it to be quite honest because it can be very off-putting especially to beginners uh, but there's nothing wrong with being self-critical if we're self-critical with our work then that's great because we've actually got an eye for what we've done wrong and by seeing what we don't like we can often make it so we do like it you know we can put right our mistakes you know, nine times out of ten you can see what mistakes you've made if you know something doesn't look right but you're not quite sure why turn your um, painting upside down or digital you can just rotate it 180 degrees or mirror it so you can um, look at your painting in a mirror and that by doing things like that it helps your brain to see things as though they were looking at them for the first time and that's when you can spot mistakes and part of being an artist is not only spotting your mistakes but uh, figuring out ways of putting them right as well okay so we've worked up a lot of darks now we, I went in and added some more dark detailing in just to make it look a bit fuller, a bit more depth, and now I'm adding some highlights. Now, as you can see, I'm not drawing the hairs from the base right up to the tip because it would just look like a row of soldiers if I did that. With the hair being quite dense along here, um, the hair furthest away and towards the top, you're only going to see the tips of those hairs because the rest of the hairs are hidden by the hairs that are in front. And obviously the hairs that are in front, you're not going to see the hair, each hair from its tip down to its root. Um, it just doesn't happen that way. And it would look like straw, it would look very artificial. So just by putting in a few wisps and a few uh, lighter highlights each way and every way, um, as long as they're heading in the right direction, it'll look more lifelike. If you take a quick look at the eye just here, you can see that I've added some uh, deeper shadows around the bottom and I've added a reddish brown to the iris. Remember with a camel, the um, pupil is elongated. So I've added that to be more prominent as well. I did some eyelashes and the long eyelashes at the bottom. Now I'm just removing some of the initial sketch from this area. If I was working in a traditional medium and I didn't want the sketch lines to show, there's a couple of things you can do. If you're working with a water-based medium and you don't want your initial sketch to show through, then use um, a water-soluble pencil, water-soluble graphite. Some people do like working in watercolour and like their sketches to show. So in that case, just use a normal graphite pencil but if you don't want your pencil lines to show when you're working with watercolour then use a water soluble pencil. If you're working in oils then it doesn't matter what you use because your oils are going to cover 
your pencil up because the oils are very opaque. If you're working in acrylics you can work either of two ways. If you work quite opaque then you can use a normal pencil but if you work with your wood with your sorry with your acrylics thinned down then you might want to think about using a water soluble pencil if you don't want your sketch to show. Okay going on now to near completion so just adding a little bit of glazing over this area here on the neck Again, we're just glazing down. Uh, I've reduced the opacity on this uh, brush just a little bit. So in other words, you'd be either thinning your medium down or using a very light hand. And there we have him, complete six and a half hours, roughly from start to finish. Um, please click on the subscribe button if you've enjoyed what you've seen and you'd like to see more. Don't forget to leave a comment if you'd like to suggest some new mediums and subjects for future videos. Thank you once again for all who've subscribed. Thank you so much. And don't forget to check out the link below for the Pixabay camel where you can draw your own camel from one of their fantastic images. Thank you again. See you soon and bye for now. Bye.